So my name is Hisham Ibrahim. I'm one of the emergency medicine consultants in Hampshire Hospitals. And um, in the next, um, let's say, 45 minutes, I will try to, um, to cover two things for you. But before I start, I have to declare here that I have no conflict of interest regarding any of what I'm going to talk about. And, uh, and now we can move to our objectives. So we'll cover two things. The medical side of things will be to discuss the possible indications for PCI other than STEMI. But the other thing that I'll try to do in parallel to the scientific part is to apply some of the engagement tools that Nasr talked about. And I'll try to apply some of the, um, of the teaching skills that I learned from Nasr in his presentation. And uh, I'd like you to try your best to focus on both and to assess me on both. And then we can discuss at the end about how I did. And you can give me your feedback about the scientific part, but as well on the um, teaching part and how to uh, how to override the barriers that Nasr talked about. So let's move on. And let's start with this. Can you all please scan this QR code? And I'll start with myself so we can all be on the page. So if you scan the QR code, you should have now on your mobile phone a title of PCI for non stemmies and uh, then two options, Qs and As. So that's questions and answers and uh, polls. And it should be on the questions and answers part. Now you can leave your mobile phone there, but if you have any questions as I'm talking, you can type your question in the type your question part on your mobile phone that you can see now. And then I will get to that question and answer it at the end of the talk. So that's regarding the first thing regarding in improving uh, the engagement as we uh, as we speak. Second thing is, if possible, and if you're happy, uh, cameras uh, are preferred to stay on so we can see each other. But if this is not going to make you comfortable, feel free to keep it closed. And now let's move on to our scientific part. We're going to go through three different cases that presented to ED. I've seen them all, so if I've seen them, then you probably have seen or will see them. And we're going to go through each case with a question at the end of them. Would you activate PCI immediately for this patient or not? And this is our first case. So 71-year-old male patient presented to ED with a cardiac sounding chest pain and shortness of breath. This patient was found to be in pulmonary edema with low blood pressure with intermittent runs of ventricular tachycardia and raised troponin. So your thought process is you think that all of this is acute coronary syndrome driven. You think that the reason behind all of this presentation is acute coronary syndrome. So you've done an ECG and interestingly, no signs of STEMI there. So again, your patient is coming with chest pain and shortness of breath that you think it is cardiac in origin. Your patient is in pulmonary edema with low blood pressure. Your patient is having runs of ventricular tachycardia and the ECG is not showing ST elevation. Question to you guys now, would this patient qualify for immediate PCI in your hospital? Time to answer. You should find that question or your mobile phones now. If you haven't managed to scan the QR code in the beginning of the talk, you, it, it should be this one. OK, so so far we've got seven responses. Ten. Let's keep going. Yeah, good. Let's have some more before we reveal the answer to this. Fourteen, fifteen, any more? OK. So it always happened to me that I reveal the answer and I get two or three more. So are you all done? OK. Great. So um, no was the answer from 81%. So and 19% said yes, this patient should qualify for an immediate PCI in their hospitals. Where are the two that they usually put their answers after I reveal it? Ah, not here today. Great. OK, so um, let's talk about this then. 
Let's talk about PCI for non-STEMIs. And let's start with the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. So this is the 2020 ESC guidelines that was actually published in 2021 in the European Heart Journal. And it talks about management of acute coronary syndrome in patients presenting with out persistent ST elevation. So this patient will present to you with acute coronary syndrome that is not associated with persistent ST elevation. What do we do for those? So this is a very nice table that covers this, uh, that flow chart. Basically, let's talk about the PCI center because this part of the of the flow chart is about the pre-hospital work and when to transfer and when not to transfer. But we're going to focus on if your patient, if your center is a PCI center, what do you do? And the first thing you do is you risk stratify your patients. If your patient is found to be a very high risk patient, then they need an immediate PCI within less than two hours. If your patient is found to be with a high risk, then they need an early PCI, early invasive treatment within less than a day, 24 hours. So it's all about the risk stratification here. Do you think that your patient is a very high risk patient, then immediate activation to the cath lab? Or actually not a very high risk, it's just a high risk, then you go for a uh, early invasive therapy. So admit with a plan to go to the cath lab within 24 hours. So it's all about the risk stratification. And here are the tools. So this is what we're going to talk about. What is very high risk? What is high risk? This is what we're going to talk about. Here's the very high risk ones. Regarding the timing of invasive therapy, the immediate invasive strategy in less than two hours is recommended in patients with one of the following. You want at least one of these, not all of them. If any hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock, that's bad. If recurrent or refractory chest pain despite minimal ma maximum medical treatment, that's bad. If life-threatening arrhythmias, that's bad. If there is any mechanical complication of MI, that is bad. If your patient is having heart failure that you think it is because of the non-STEMI, that's bad. And if your patient is having some ST depressions um, with uh, ST elevation in AVR, that is bad. So if you apply this to our case, you'll find that our patient was hemodynamically unstable with a, a low blood pressure. Our patient was having runs of ventricular tachycardia and our patient has had acute pulmonary edema. So if you combine all of this, you need just one to activate the cath lab. So our patient per the European Society of Cardiology guidelines is for cath lab activation. So how about the American guidelines? So this is the this is the statement that produced by the American College of Cardiology, quoting actually what the European Society of Cardiology published. So this was published in August 2020, and this is what they mentioned regarding the invasive uh, angio. They said that immediate invasive angio is required if your patient is unstable, or uh, from the hemodynamic point of view, or from the arrhythmia point of view, or if your patient is having acute heart failure or persistent chest pain. So it's almost the same as the indications for the uh, in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. So no massive difference here. So this is um, so these are the American guidelines in relation to a case like this. So let's go back to our case and see where we are. Our patient was a 71 year old male patient presented with a cardiac sounding chest pain. Our patient was found to have pulmonary edema with low blood pressure, with runs of VT and raised troponin. Our patient, we were thinking that he's got a acute coronary syndrome driving all of this. So the ECG is not showing any ST elevation. And the question is now to you, and I would like you to type your answer now. Would you activate this uh, PCI for this patient immediately? You can answer by yes or no. So, so far, four yeses, six yeses. I want to see the 81% who voted no.
Oh dear, that is uh, that is psychologically painful to me. No, if you sell it well to the cardiology team, they will uh, they will accept it. Just be clear and uh, and express your concerns. So eleven responders out of the sixteen that voted in the first one. Okay, so so far. No, you don't know if cardiology will decline or not. And if they if they disagree, you can just uh, let them know that you're just following the recommendations of the European Society of Cardiology and the American College of Cardiology. So it should be fine. This patient is a very high risk uh, rather than high risk because of the um, hemodynamic instability, because of the acute heart failure secondary to ACS, and because of the um, ventricular tachycardia that is counted as a, uh, um, a fatal arrhythmia that can happen. So I would disagree. I would say this patient is a very high risk. Uh, yeah, this patient will need ITU too. I wouldn't disagree with this. Uh, I'm just talking about the management of the patient rather than the logistics of achieving this management. Uh, but I agree with you, this patient will need critical care support to go to the cath lab. Any further comments from you regarding the first case? Okay. Just before proceeding, uh, Hora asked the question. I don't know if, uh, if she had the answer already. So what's your question, Hope? For high risk, which scoring system to use? And echo oh, so we're not, focus? Oh, we're not talking about the scoring systems. We're talking about the high risk features that I mentioned uh, in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. This is uh, not related to the heart score or the modified heart score or any other uh, risk stratifying system. It is the high risk features from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines that I have just mentioned. We'll revisit that anyway. Is that okay, everyone? Great. Let's move on to our next case. So case number two is a 64-year-old male patient presented to ED following an unexplained ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest. So unexplained pre-hospital VF cardiac arrest now you've got ROSC. The patient is hemodynamically stable with normal blood pressure. You've done a 12 lead ECG and it showed no signs of STEMI. So you've got a patient who's post VF cardiac arrest. The VF was unexplained. You couldn't find a reason for it. Your patient now has got ROSC. Your patient is hemodynamically stable. The ECG of this patient is showing no STEMI. Question to you now. Do you think that this patient would qualify for immediate PCI in your hospital? Yes or no? So we've got 13 responses. Any more? Yeah. Good. OK. Let's see. OK, interesting. We've got almost 50-50 split. So uh, half of you believe that this patient qualifies for immediate PCI. Yes, there is always one at the end. Now it's a nice balance. Definite 50-50 split. Half of you for immediate PCI, half of you are for, not for immediate PCI. Uh, great, let's have a look at um, what we uh, what we could do for this patient. Let's talk about post VF cardiac arrest PCI. Who, uh, who to send to the cath lab, who not to, to send to the cath lab immediately. So uh, the first question is, where do we stand with evidence at the moment? Well, we need to split those patients into two big categories the post-ROSC, the post-VF uh, patients. The first category is post-cardiac arrest with a STEMI in their ECGs. 
And this is the easy one. There is no argument about this one. There is no discussion about this one. This one is just straightforward, just sent to the cat lab. So that is any post-cardiac arrest with STEMI in their ECGs. But there is another group that can confuse some of us. That is the post-cardiac arrest patients without ST elevation in their ECGs. This one is a bit tricky. So let's, if you do some evidence search here, you will find um, that in 2014, there were clear recommendations from the American Heart Association that any post-VF cardiac arrest should go immediately to the cat lab. So if we go back to 2014 and have a look at the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology guidelines with managing these patients with um, non-ST non elevation, acute coronary syndromes, post-VF cardiac arrest, they put there the following. Immediate catheterization is now indicated for patients who are post-VF cardiac arrest, even in the absence of ST elevation in their ECGs. Crystal clear, no doubt, no discussion. Any patient who's post-VF cardiac arrest without ST elevation should go to the cath lab immediately. But over the past few years, the evidence started growing up and new evidence started to appear. And then in 2019, the COAC trial results came out with a bit of a surprise. So the COAC stands for coronary angio after cardiac arrest without ST elevation. It was a decently done uh, study that was published in April 2019. And it was a multi-center trial. It was uh, it included a, a random allocation of the candidates. They've included about um, 552 patients uh, with cardiac arrest without any signs of STEMI. So a decent number of cases. Uh, some of them uh, were taken immediately to the cath lab and some of them they've had their cath lab delayed till uh, they had a full neurological recovery. So the primary endpoint was the survival at 90 days with some other secondary endpoints. And here is what they found. They found that actually the strategy of immediate angio was not found to be better than the delayed angio. So taking the patient to the cath lab immediately showed no difference in, uh, in the 90 days survival compared to taking the patient later after full neurological recovery. So that was a bit of a surprise and, and it surprised me personally because I was, I was a bit more towards that the, these patients should go to the cath lab as long as the VF is unexplained. Uh, they should go immediately. But the study was well done and, um, and actually this is the outcome of the study. And shortly after publishing the study, that the European Society of Cardiology guidelines uh, changed and this, this one came out. This is the same one that we've talked about before when we talked about uh, managing acute coronary syndrome patients without persistent ST elevation. So these are risk factors that who are asked about, who's very high risk, who's high risk. And um, if we look at the high risk ones, we find that we'll find that that resuscitated cardiac arrest without ST elevation or cardiogenic shock is there. So actually, it is in this part. High risk, they get early invasive therapy. So that is a PCI within 24 hours, not immediately. So how does this reflect to my practice? Well, actually, what I do is. I would activate the cath lab for these if I think it is indicated and it's for the cardiologist to decide whether they need to go now to the cath lab or any time between now and the next 24 hours. So I used to feel a little bit unhappy uh, to get a response of no to this, but after going through these guidelines and understanding the rationale behind this, now I'm more than happy to accept that this patient is not going to go to the cath lab now because there are other priorities and it won't make any difference. And we'll go to the cath lab within the next 24 hours. So let's move on. Here are the recommendations in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. They said that delayed as opposed to immediate and due should be considered in hemodynamically stable patient without ST elevation successfully resuscitated after an out of hospital cardiac arrest. And it was written in yellow, which means that this is a class 2A uh, evidence, uh, which means uh, should be considered. So that's the color coding of these guidelines. 
So let's go back to our case to see where we are. This was a patient who was 64 years old, presented with an unexplained VF cardiac arrest. Now we've got ROSC. The patient is hemodynamically stable, normal blood pressure, ECG, no ST elevation. Do you think this patient needs an immediate PCI? Yes or no, please. So given he is stable hemodynamically, yes, per new guidelines. Sorry, is this one person writing a statement or? Because I'm not sure who is trying to say what. If we stick to yes and no, probably it will be easier. OK, so we've got nine responses. Um, I'm not sure if this is a phone number or something. OK. So, so far, yes is getting bigger, bigger and greener, which means that most of you are, uh, are writing the same. And uh, no per, per the guidelines, I mean, OK, so that means that the hemodynamic is stable. No, so within 24 hours. OK, so I guess we all know now that um, this patient needs to go to the cath lab any time between that presentation and uh, the next 24 hours. So there is an interesting question in the chat uh, from. Uh, so there are two questions. So one uh, from Dr. Muhammad Hassan. Uh, so with regard to the trial, did they do subgroup analysis for those who had shockable versus non-shockable rhythm? I am uh, not sure. So as far as I remember, because I've read it for a while ago, we're dealing here with only post VF cardiac arrest. So they should have all been uh, with shockable rhythm rather than non-shockable. That's as far as I remember. It's been a while since I've read this, but that's my understanding from the trial in general. Regarding the question of Mustafa, that's an interesting one. So why VF is not considered life-threatening arrhythmia as a very high-risk feature? It is a life-threatening uh, um, uh, arrhythmia, uh, clearly. But the question is, are you in VF that is resistant, not resolving? Or you've had an episode of VF that is completely gone and it's not happening again? So it's not just about having a one episode of a life-threatening arrhythmia. It's about having persistent arrhythmia, secondary to persistent ischemia, that does not resolve with medical treatment, then I would consider it, yes, that's an indication for the cath lab because your medical treatment will fail to fix this arrhythmia. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so Thank going you. through the, yes? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying thank you. Thank you. Uh, lovely. So that was, our case number two, and now we can move on to case number uh, three. Th there was so our, uh, a question. Yes. Uh, there is two questions as well in the poll there. Uh, is age, re age related here to activate PCI, and is the troponin level indicated as well? So, um, okay, so regarding the age, I'm not aware about any age. Uh, as a, a limiting or, or decisive factor. You don't look at the, uh, the age, you look at the physiological age. So I think what's more important is the pre-morbid status of the patient and how unwell well they were before the incident. Uh, and that, that is definitely uh, required for your discussion with cardiology regarding how far to go with the, with the patient. I'm talking here about if we take all the other factors aside and we just focus on the... Uh, post unexplained VF ROSC, do they need to go to the cath lab now or they can go within 24 hours? The answer is they can go within 24 hours. But when within these 24 hours, that it is a decision 
uh, for the cardiologist to decide based upon the general condition of the patient and how they think and their, their situ the situation of the cath lab as well. So they can decide their priorities, but this patient will not take a priority over a STEMI patient, for example. The STEMI patient will need to go immediately to the cath lab. So that's regarding uh, the first part of the question. Uh, the second part about the troponin, the troponin of any pulse VF cardiac arrest, I would expect to be high anyway, uh, partly because of the um, of the chest compression and partly because of the cardioversion, uh, the DC shock. So I don't really think that tropo the troponin per se is going to be a um, a big decisive factor here. I think it will be high anyway. Does this answer the question? I I guess so. Okay. Uh, so there, there is another two questions in the chat box from uh, William and from Hor. Okay. Uh, do we admit locally or transfer to a cardiac center? So again, it depends upon where you work and what sort of, of local policies do you have. So uh, if I apply this to Hampshire hospitals where we work, then um, if this patient present to our non-PCI center, which is uh, in Winchester, then I will definitely discuss with cardiology regarding a, a transfer to CCU in Basingstoke, which is our PCI center, so the patient can be near the cath lab. But again, if we all know that this patient does not need the cath lab now, and there are no beds in CCU, I would accept that this patient can be admitted locally with a plan of transfer whenever there is a bed available, um, because we want that this patient is gonna end up in the cath lab anyway within the next 24 hours. So best thing is to keep the patient next to the cath lab, but if this is not achievable, then this is not achievable. So that's a discussion with cardiology. Regarding the other question from Ho, so if patient has chest pain before going to the rest, will it change our management as uh, it will be an explained VF? Well, again, do you have ST elevation in the ECG after ROSC or not? That would be the key thing here. If that was a STEMI, causing the, the VF cardiac arrest, they will, the, that, that STEMI will stay there and you will get the, um, the cath lab activated anyway. If, uh, if this is a non-STEMI, then that will put the patient under the category of, yeah, they can wait to, uh, to go to the cath lab within 24 hours. Is that clear enough? Okay, thank you. Let's move on to our third case then. So case number three, 69 year old male patient presented to ED with a history of chest pain with an ECG that showed STEMI pre-hospitally. So this is a patient who was at home, got some chest pain, the ambulance crew went, did an ECG, found a STEMI. So they gave the patient some aspirin, some uh, uh, GTN, and um, immediately started the transfer process to the hospital. But after giving, the aspirin and the GTN on arrival to ED, the patient became pain-free. They repeated the ECG, no ST elevation whatsoever. So this patient has had a STEMI pre-hospitally that completely resolved on arrival to ED from the ECG side of things. And no chest pain on arrival to ED. So clinically better and the ECG is better. The question to you guys. Would this patient qualify for immediate PCI in your hospital? Yes or no? Okay, so we've got 16 responses. Let's have a look. Interesting. So again, it's almost 50-50. Oh, yes, yes, it is 50-50. Someone's changed their mind to make it nicely balanced. So half of you would activate the cath lab immediately. Half of you will not be too worried about activating the cath lab immediately. That's interesting. Let's see if uh, if you're going to change your practice uh, after the discussion or not. Let's talk about the PCI for transient ST elevation. 
back to the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. And um, again, we're talking about management of ACS in patient without persistent ST elevation. And here's what they say. They've done uh, a cardiac MRI assessment to the infarct size in these patients. And they found that in patients with a transient ST elevation and complete resolution of symptoms, an immediate invasive strategy did not reduce the infarct size in the MRI, did not add much benefit from this point of view. So the early, the immediate versus delayed showed no difference in the infarct size. So here are the recommendations. You need to do an early invasive within 24 hours. That is recommended in patients with any of the following high risk, not the very high risk, just the high risk criteria. And one of them is transient ST elevation. And again, this is in green. So actually this is a class one evidence. That is the highest level of evidence that you can get. So it is recommended or indicated. So any patient with a transient ST elevation, they should go to the cath lab, but not right now, as long as it's transient and as long as the patient is symptom free. Then they can have, go to the cath lab now or any time between now and the next 24 hours. So if you go back to the case, that was a patient with chest pain, STEMI pre hospitally, no STEMI on arrival to ED, no pain on arrival to ED. Would you activate the cath lab immediately? Do you think this patient needs an immediate PCI? Yes or no in your answers. You should enter a ward here. OK, so the answer to this one is I would activate the cath lab, but I would completely discuss with the cardiology to discuss. Do we need to go to the cath lab now or to go to the cath lab? any time within the next 24 hours. And I would completely accept, not now, we're gonna go in the next set number of hours, whatever they think. So that's regarding this one. So um, who is asking now? Won't be uh, worried about an underlying process similar to Wellen syndrome and reocclusion. Yes, correct. And that's why I said, we're, we're gonna, refer to cardiology, we're going to discuss the cath lab activation and we're going to go to the cath lab, but not necessarily right now. So in Wellen syndrome, they develop, so 75% of cases will develop STEMI within a medium of 21 days. Yes, no one can predict whether they, that is it going to be in five minutes time or in 21 days time, but we still have the time. It's not like in the next five minutes, this patient is going to get a STEMI. So there's a big difference between the Wellen syndrome pathology and the De Winter sign, for example, where you will get the STEMI happening in front of your eyes in your presence. So that is the biggest difference between the two. For this case, if the STEMI is completely resolved, then yes, it is a very similar, it is actually Wellen syndrome. It's very similar, it's the same pathology, but probably without the Wellen's uh, sign. And you can apply this rule to Wellen's as well. So they need to go to the cath lab, if I see Wellens, I will refer to cardiology. If they say go to the cath lab now, I'll be happy with that. If they say admit, we will take it from there. We will go to the cath lab in the next 24 hours. I will also accept because it is the same thing. So the evidence does not support immediate over delayed cath lab. So hemodynamically, what about fibrinolytic and hemodynamically stable? Well, so regarding the fibrinolysis, the thing is, um, the it's, it's all about where you work and what sort of local policies do you have. So in, in the UK practice, there is always a way to get to a cath lab within 24 hours, sorry, within within two hours. So the pre-hospital teams are, are, are really, uh, really great with this and they can transfer any patient to a PCI center within two hours in most areas uh, within UK. 
I would assume that in America, for example, the, the distance is very different and the, the, the locations are very far from each other. So that might not be the case. And in other countries, the PCI facility might not be the case. So I would say regarding the, uh, the thrombolytic therapy in these cases, I would discuss with cardiology to see what they think if I feel that I won't be able to transfer within 24 hours to a PCI center. And probably I doubt that you would delay the transfer for over 24 hours. You have 24 hours to transfer this patient to a PCI center. I think you, you can do it. But that's totally dependent on the resources in, in, in where you work. OK, so let's quickly flick through some learning points. So immediate PCI within two hours is recommended in patients with non-STEMI if hemodynamically unstable or electrically unstable. So persistent VT, persistent VF. Yes, that's bad. I would I would activate the cath lab. Or pain not responding to maximum medical therapy. So these are the three indications in my trust that I've written for them to follow. This is when we activate the cath lab for non-STEMIs in our local hospital. Hemodynamic instability, electrical instability, and pain not responding to maximum medical treatment. So that includes GTN infusion. And early PCI within 24 hours is recommended for patients with non-STEMI if post cardiac arrest but stable, transient ST elevation. Those are the ones that I would send. I would try to speak to cardiologist to activate the cath lab, but I would accept if they accept going immediately or if they prefer to wait uh, because there are other priorities for the cath lab, I would completely understand why and I would understand the rationale and the evidence to support that decision. So these are uh, the learning points that we've been through over the last half an hour. And now is the time for your questions. Feel free to type your questions on your mobile phones or to type them on your chat section. Let's play with the app and type your questions on, uh, on the app if you want. The app is playing up. Is that true? Is it playing up for everyone? No, it's not playing up for everyone. That was me saying no, by the way. It's not playing up for me. Okay. So, uh, any questions? Thank you. It's all anonymized. Uh, I, I should have mentioned this in the beginning of the talk till I know that I, I will I will never know who voted for what. OK, so what if patient deteriorates after classifying uh, him not for immediate cath lab? Definitely that is a new patient for you and uh, you would assess and uh, and deal with what you get. And I would definitely reactivate the cath lab if um, if I see an indication for this. So when the condition changes, then the whole situation changes and you reassess and do what you find. So, OK, so uh, oh, someone is typing something, so let's wait. Oh, thank you, Vlad. So let's see if you've written any questions uh, during the talk. So uh, why VF not considered life-threatening arrhythmia? We've answered that. Uh, is age-related here? Uh, we've answered that. Troponin level, that is the uh, non-STEMI one, and we've answered that. That is the post-VF one. So no further questions written during the day. Uh, during the talk and great. So uh, how about then uh, writing uh, your impression about using the engaging apps versus not using them in online teaching? And I've tried in this talk to apply 
what uh, Nasser talked about, just to give you a flavor about how it feels and to get your feedback about this, because I'm learning myself. So um, do you think that the engaging app improved your engagement with the talk or actually it was not the case? Feel free to uh, let's go back. Feel free to free type here if you want to type anything. It is nice if you don't have a skill to learn. Uh, OK. You all have skills to learn. OK. Oh, so uh, using the mobile phone uh, to, 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 to follow the lecture and in the same time to apply the app is, is almost impossible. It won't work. So uh, almost always you need to have a separate screen uh, for the talk and a separate screen for the app. I agree sometimes the app may interrupt the flow of the lecture, but I think it's all about the lecturer. So, um, so we as uh, as speakers should learn when to uh, when to talk, when to stop talking, and how long to allow uh, for the app to do the uh, the action. So, but I agree with you. If I misuse it, it will uh, not be nice. So one more participant is typing something. OK, so a great feature of the app to enter the code at the start so I can use the phone. Yeah, I completely agree. It is very useful from this point of view. Great. And that's another important thing about the apps. So I uh, I learn uh, and I get the the feedback about. How much? Uh, the split in the decision is in the in the audience rather than to assume that uh, oh they follow this side or that side of things. But if you have it in front of you um, in in an actual percent, you can tell um, how how much of your audience is with which opinion. And um, the other thing that no one has mentioned, and I personally found it the most important feature in these polls, is the fact that it is completely anonymized. So if I'm sitting in a live lecture, I might feel a bit shy to raise my hand and ask a question or to give a comment. But if I know that no one is going to see my comment, no one is, is going to see me doing the comment, my comment is going to reach, my question is going to reach the speaker without knowing who asked that question, I'll feel more encouraged to ask and to give the feedback that I want without the fear of uh, looking awkward in front of the others. So I, I personally feel that this is the most important feature in uh, in this app. OK, great. So if no more questions or comments to me, then probably we can bring this to a closure. So from my side, thank you very much for being here.